Hey everyone, Jonathan and Molly here, and welcome back to Savoring the Magic, where we believe there is magic in the details. That's right, so today we are in Animal Kingdom for the first time on the vlog. I know, I'm sorry it's taken us this long, <laughs> but nevertheless, we are here, and right. Animal Kingdom is a park that we absolutely adore, and fun fact for us, it's actually the first Disney park that we were here for on opening day. It's true. So we're gonna talk about some of the changes that have happened since then, so it's development, um, and kind of where it's going. So come along with us on this excursion. Ah, there she is. She's beauty and she's grace. That's right. Yes, and we I do only, say that about- I only apply oh. that to Epcot in here. And Cinderella, Castle occasionally Sometimes, as well. Yeah. All the major park icons, right. really. I don't really I say that for thing, Tower, but. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like it would be a weird thing to say for Tower, though. That's true. Uh, come plunge and <laughs> be terrified. But with Beauty and Grace. That's right. So, pro tip as we sit here and memorize the script um, <laughs> come to the Flame Tree Barbecue, walk all the way down here to the water. And it is such a fantastic seating area. Yes. Uh, especially before lunchtime. Yes. No one's here. It's just you and the uh, occasional squirrel and bird. And the flotillas. And the flotillas. Where they play some very interesting musical choices yes. sometimes. <laughs> it's a good time. Uh, and of course, incredible views of Everest and yes. Asia. So there you go. Highly recommend. You can thank us later. Also, just like a behind the scenes shot of what it looks like uh, before we film things. That's right. So, long before Animal Kingdom was a concept, animals were pivotal to the Walt Disney Company. Obviously, they featured heavily as key characters in a lot of the Disney animated films. Walt would even bring in live animals so that his animators could capture the physiology and movements of them for the features. So, deer were brought in for Bambi, baby elephants were brought in for Dumbo, and dogs were brought in for Lady and the Tramp. Of course, Walt pursued his interest in animals in different ways. His first true life adventure series started in 1948 with Seal Island. The studio would make a total of 13 of these nature documentaries and eight of them would win Academy Awards. Walt even initially wanted live animals in Disneyland's Jungle Cruise, but was vetoed for the sake of a consistent show. We always joke amongst ourselves that no idea within Disney really ever dies. In the case of live animals in a park, that is certainly the case. The idea of an animal-based park came together through a variety of circumstances. For one, the competition here in Florida was heating up with the opening of Universal Studios, and the top brass at Disney were convinced that a fourth park would help to keep visitors here at Disney World longer for their vacations. Eisner had also been impressed by the San Diego Zoo, which had pioneered cage-free animal exhibits and had been on several African safaris. He thought there was potential that Disney World could do to the old-fashioned zoo what Disneyland had done to theme parks in the 50s. Of course, while all these sentiments from Eisner were helpful, Animal Kingdom as we know it today would not have been possible without Joe Rohde. A California native with parents in the film business who spent a large chunk of his childhood in the natural beauty and culture of Hawaii. When Michael Eisner told him that they had the Magic Kingdom, but they should have an Animal Kingdom, Joe Rohde ran with that idea. Rohde and his team of six people worked out of a tiny trailer on the Imagineering campus for about a year. There was a lot of skepticism and even opposition to the idea of this animal-based park. And after that year, they were in need of some serious capital to move forward. So Rhodey arranged a memorable pitch meeting. To hit home the idea that an animal park was exciting and sustainable, they arranged for a leopard to be brought in by an animal trader for their first meeting, but instead they went with the Bengal tiger because the leopard was a little too jumpy. Regardless, it created a pitch meeting that Michael Eisner, Frank Wells, Marty Scalar, and a handful of others would never forget. Rhodey's proposal blended three concepts into one, a traditional theme park with entertaining attractions, an Epcot-style emphasis on dramatized education, and live animals presented in a way unlike any zoo. That meeting was recounted differently by those in attendance, but the desired effect was achieved. Rhodey and his team had permission to keep working, Every three months, they had to apply for another tiny amount of money to keep their team working on this concept. Eventually, they made headway when they convinced Dick Nunes, who is head of theme park operations, in a one-on-one -on -one presentation. Once Nunes was their ally, they were eventually able to get the green light from Meister. Construction began in 1994, and they weren't the only ones. Universal Studios was also moving ahead with another gate, 
Islands of Adventure. Still the planning and building of Animal Kingdom forged on. Rody's team took six trips to Africa, exploring on their own and sometimes joining packaged family tours that ranged from discount safaris to luxury excursions. Rody believed that these immersive trips were necessary since this new park would be based in realism instead of idealized. They returned home from these trips with animal stories, design ideas, and thousands of photographs. It should be noted that these photos weren't just of local art, architecture, or the animals in their natural environment, but also the things we don't pay attention to. The way the tire tracks left indentations in the mud or the way people mounted electrical wiring to a wall, it was a new kind of storytelling for Imagineering, not fanciful, but grounded in the day-to-day -day culture of the locations being replicated. With that in mind, the park's lands would be selected to showcase the animals' contemporary habitats like Africa and Asia. The story that would unify the park was the intrinsic value of nature and the wildlife found within it. The realism would serve fictional places like Harambe. The locations might have fictional names, but they are deeply rooted in the continents they're based on. The fictional part also allowed them to push together animal habitats that would have been spread across both continents and let them avoid references to specific places or potential geopolitical events. In preparation for this story centered on nature, Disney actually bought an entire tree farm, cultivating thousands of trees and accelerator planters across four years, which transformed seedlings into adult plants rather than breaking the budget by having to buy full-size plants at the last minute. Landscape designer Paul Comstock supervised the plantings and also traveled the world to find many of his materials needed to provide a lush but pleasing to the eye environment. In the end, this would require 4 million plants from six continents and 1.5 million cubic yards of earth in order to keep them nurtured. Of course, the introduction of live animals to the park trumped all other design elements. The reality of animals and their unpredictable behaviors permeated every facet of the design process from gathering reference material to the infield art direction. Also, Disney had never done anything this scale with live animals, so they were just as concerned about the animals' welfare as the activists. They brought in advisors from the ASPCA to zoologists to conservationists and followed their guidance closely. The Disney Conservation Fund was also established in 1995, which helps fund conservation efforts around the world. This was also key for them to put them in touch with the right people that could help bring animals into the park. Zoologist Rick Barongi, who had worked for the San Diego Zoo, was recruited in 1993 as the general manager of animal operations for Animal Kingdom. He would lead the charge in finding and acquiring the park's animal population. He was also tasked not just showcasing these animals, but presenting them as they actually live and just giving us a small glimpse into it. Disney's Wild Animal Kingdom was announced on June 5, 1995, three months after the 500-acre site had been cleared for construction. And yes, the wild in the title would be dropped by the following February. Some animal rights activists quickly took to organizing against the park, but Disney was able to quiet concerns with the help of experts like Jane Goodall and leaders with the American Zoo and Aquarium Association and the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Their dedicated efforts to conservation and the closely followed advice of experts helped to win this support. About a year before the park was completed, Disney began transporting the animals into Florida so they could begin to be acclimated to the Florida climate. Most of the animals were acquired from more than 200 accredited zoos in the United States. Animal Kingdom is itself an accredited zoo, but much more than that since the park is able to go into the stories of the animals and the ways in which humans interact with them. Of course, Animal Kingdom wouldn't just feature live animals. The park is built on a story foundation that includes three major realms of how we interact with animals. First, there are the areas that focus on elevating appreciation of animals and awareness of the issues relating to them. These animals drive the action in the oasis, Africa, Asia, and Rafiki's Planet Watch. Secondly, the park contains references to extinct animals. We see them through reconstructions of their fossils or artistic representations of their likenesses. And I think we can all agree that dinosaurs in particular hold a certain fascination for people. So this is the primary focus of Dino Land USA. Lastly, the park contains a story category for mythical animals and the various forms that they take. This group says more about the humans than it does the animals, for it has to do with the attributes that we project onto animals. This concept was initially seen most in Camp Mini Mickey and almost had a foothold with a mythical section of the park which would have focused on dragons called the Beastly Kingdom, which we will talk about in depth in another video because that's a whole other thing in itself. With these story ethos in mind, the $800 million park would debut on April 22nd, 1998, which was also Earth Day. By 9 a.m., the park was at capacity. On opening day, Kilimanjaro Safari was the true hit of the park. Camp Mini Mickey is the only opening day area that is no longer here. Stylistically based on the At Iron Dock Mountains in upstate New York, it was meant to be the place where the Disney characters go to vacation. 
It represented Disney's fictional creatures and our tendency to anthropomorphize them. The area was home to meet and greets for different characters. It was also the home to the original Festival of the Lion King show and the stage show Pocahontas and her forest friends. This show had Pocahontas as a hostess introducing us to her animal friends and talked about preserving the homes of these friends with the help of Grandmother Willow and a young sapling named Sprig. Since the rest of these opening day areas are still here for now, we're going to walk around <laughs> and give you guys a brief introduction to each area. The Oasis is the first place you encounter as you scan your ticket or magic band. It's our escape from the reality of the world outside the park. It's presented as an unspoiled part of nature and is meant to be awe-inducing. Also, think of it as the main street of Animal Kingdom. It's meant to cause a dramatic break and immerse us in this different environment that we're about to encounter. Discovery Island functions like the hub at Magic Kingdom and features the park's icon, the Tree of Life. Of course, the Tree of Life is quite the icon and features over 325 animals. Discovery Island isn't based on any single place in the world and is an amalgamation of the architecture and folk art of cultures found on equatorial islands around the world like Bali and the South Seas. The architecture is clean, bright, and colorful, and it's meant to mirror the ideas expressed in the Tree of Life, hence the animal motifs all over the buildings. It's the stepping off point for the adventure that awaits. Discovery Island is also home to one of the original attractions to the park, which is It's Tough to Be a Bug. Always a great show. Yes. Um, we forgot that you can't film in there, so just kidding. Um, <laughs> but we'll insert some stuff here, you can see. Yeah. Um, it's always really hilarious to me because that show is kind of intense, especially if you have like little, little ones. Yes. And there is always at least one like a child that I feel sorry for that's terrified. Yes. Particularly, I think it's, it's the spiders coming down or um, being sprayed with acid or whatever the case may be. Yeah. What's the other thing? It's it's all the stuff with Hopper, I think. Yeah. Whenever it gets really dark and like you're being sprayed and just yeah. all of, of stuff, that very a lot of stuff happening. Stuff. And uh, the funny thing is, I remember it being very overwhelming as a kid. Yeah. Because I think I was like, what, nine whenever the park opened? Something like that. So I remember that. But then, you know, you just get older and you kind of forget. Yeah. You get so used to it. Like, I love that show. It's like, bugs are super important. And I love that we talk about it. And, uh, but yeah, then we get in there and I hear the screams of children. I'm like, oh, that's right. This is a very intense show. I remember all of a sudden. Uh, The fictional city of Harambe makes up the Africa portion of Animal Kingdom. Harambe was designed to be like so many places in Africa where people live in close proximity to real wildlife on the edge of the wilderness. The decision to portray this version of African life was based on storytelling. One story they wanted to communicate here was that nature is a pristine thing with animals that must be protected from poaching. Of course, the original version of the safari had that kind of storyline to it. Now it's a little different, however, we still love it. So since we've been talking about Africa, it only makes sense that we would ride Kilimanjaro Safari. The ride has changed some since opening day, but it has been here since opening day. So let's go hop on that. Jumbo, everyone, and welcome to Kilimanjaro Safaris. In order to keep your wait time to a minimum, we ask that you please keep your room together, keep up with the party in front of you,
Mike here in Harambe. We say twin day. No, twin day means let's go. Jumbo, everybody. My name is Parker, and I'll be your spotting guide to the Harambe Wildlife Reserve. Take a look above you. That's your animal spotting guide. Now, due to migratory patterns, we might not see all these animals today. We've had pretty good luck so far. Hey, quick show of hands. Is anyone's first time on the reserve? Oh, great. Me too. That's awesome. Just kidding. We actually got a couple of safety rules before we get started today. Just make sure you stay seated for the entire safari, keeping those hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the truck at all times. That's no copy. Now, a lot of people think the copy is related to the zebra because of the stripes on their back legs. However, their closest living relative is not a zebra. Does anyone know what it is? Yeah. It is a giraffe. They're the only living relative of the giraffe. We know that because their skeletal structure is very similar to a giraffe, especially the skull. Both the okapi and the giraffe also have a very long prehensile tongue. Now what prehensile means it can grab things. Their tongue is about 18 inches long. Now black burners are mostly solitary animals. They can get pretty territorial with each other. So how do we tell apart black rhinos from other species of rhino found here on the preserve and in Africa? The white rhino is actually by looking at their lips. So the black rhino up there has a very pointed, uh, pretty small prehensile upper lip to grab the vegetation they eat. Well, white rhinos have very wide lips used for grazing on grass. If you see any of them later, you'll see what I'm talking about. Weighing upwards of about 5,000 pounds. Now, where hippopotamus in Greek means river horse, almost purely made of muscle, so they sink straight to the bottom. They trot along the bottom of the water, holding their breath for about five to eight minutes at a time. On land, hippos can run at speeds of about 30 miles per hour. They'll spend most of their day down in the water, usually coming out at nighttime to do all their grazing, where they can get up to about 100 pounds of vegetation in one night. Hippos have a very powerful bite force, being able to extend their jaws almost 180 degrees. Now, they can get territorial and aggressive even towards humans, but as long as you stay out of their way, they're going to stay out of your way. Now, way out there, you can see some giraffes. So there are four species of giraffe in the world. There are the northern giraffe, there are the southern giraffe, and then there's the reticulated giraffe, and then there's this last species, which is the uh, Maasai giraffe. Now, I can tell those are Maasai giraffe out there because of that rigid structure in their coat. That pattern is unique to each animal. It's kind of like your thumbprints. Also, a group of giraffe is called a tower of giraffe. Over here off to the left, all the way in the back with those long horns, those are sable antelope, one of the few antelope species that'll stand their ground whenever there are predators nearby, using their horns in self-defense and typically led by a dominant female. Also off to the left side of the truck, these animals with these massive horns, those are Ancoli cattle, also called the Watusi cattle, because of the tribe that domesticated them. They were used as a sign of wealth, so the more you had, the wealthier you were. Those horns are not very heavy, they get to be about three to five feet in length. On the inside, it's a honeycomb-like structure, and through that structure run blood vessels, which regulate their body temperature. Now, a lot of animals out here on the African savanna have to be able to learn to stand and run very early in life to avoid predators. For example, with the giraffe, it's anywhere between 15 minutes to an hour after they're born. Now, just a reminder, friends, do not try to reach out and touch any animals that get close. Now, coming up on the right side of the truck, we're going to see the largest land mammal in the world, weighing upwards of 13,000 pounds. That is an African elephant. So with the African elephant, we can actually kind of tell how they're feeling based on what those ears are doing. If you've seen elephant's ears flared out, that means they're upset. Probably a good idea to stay out of the way. If an elephant is flapping their ears, probably just trying to cool themselves off, kind of like using a very large fan. So it'll swing in any direction. They can also eat about 300 pounds of food per day. Now, elephants can live to be about 60 to 70 years old, but unfortunately out in the wild, most of them will not make it to that age. It does sad me to tell you almost 96 elephants are poached each day for the ivory in their tusks. If you do the math, that's once almost every 15 minutes. And at that rate, elephants could be gone in the next few decades. Actually, some researchers out in the wild have even been noticing Whenever they got close to certain groups of elephants, the elephants would try to hide their tusks from them because the elephants have started to figure out that's why they're being poached is for those tusks. Now over here off to the left side of the truck, we're going to see the greater flamingo, the tallest of the six flamingo species in the world, standing almost five feet tall. They're also the most light pink of all flamingos. 
No, they're born, they're not born that pink color, they're born a grayer coloration. It takes about a year or two after they're born for them to fully turn pink. So, how do they do it? It's actually from the beta carrots and found in their diet, which is mostly brine, shrimp, and algae. Also, the name for a flock of flamingos is called a flamboyant of flamingos. Now, cheetahs reach speeds of about 60 to 70 miles per hour in about 3 to 4 seconds. Actually, in just 3 steps, they can hit 40 miles per hour. Now, the cheetah's claws are non-retractable. They're the only cats that cannot fully retract their claws. It's kind of like cleats on an athlete to help them run and get up to those really fast speeds. Also, into their tail is very large and muscular, which they use as a counterbalance so they can quickly change direction to capture their prey. Now, directly ahead of us, you're going to see the white rhino, the larger of the two rhino species on the reserve, weighing upwards of 5,000 pounds. Now, remember, uh, you can tell apart white rhinos from black rhinos by looking for the very wide lips that the white rhinos have. Also, they're nearsighted, and at night time, their eyesight's pretty poor, but watch that rhino's ears. You can see its ears tilting around their head. It's one of their main senses they use for their directions as they're hearing, also using their really good sense of smell. Now, this is actually a subspecies of the white rhino. This is the southern white rhino. In the country of Uganda, they disappeared for about 30 years. Animal Kingdom, along with a few other zoological facilities, actually helped to reintroduce a population, some of them from this very safari, back to Uganda. And since then, that number has been slowly going up to this day. But for the other subspecies of white rhino, the northern white rhino, it's a pretty sad story. Five years ago, they made headlines around the world when the last male passed away. They're now functionally extinct. There's only two female northern white rhinos left in the entire world. Listen, 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 listen. Sounds like a lion, and I speak a little lion, so it, it sounds like he's trying to tell us that everything the light touches is his kingdom. And sure enough, just lying around up there, it's going to be an African lion. Now, a certain Disney movie might tell you that the lion sleeps tonight. They actually rest anywhere between 16 up to 20 hours a day. Now, in the early to mid 1900s, there were about 100,000 lions in the wild. But unfortunately, today, due to things like habitat loss and poaching, there's now less than 20,000. There's that male lion right there off to the left side. Now, if you're off to the right side of the truck, we're going to see the world's largest bird, the ostrich. Uh -oh. Ostrich stands around 8 to 9 feet tall, weighing almost 300 pounds. Now, we all know that they're flightless. They still have wings, which they use for aerodynamics, so and they quickly run at speeds of about 40 miles per hour. Another great way to get involved is donating. Since 1995, Disney Conservation Fund has raised over $125 million to help animals around the world. It doesn't matter how big or how small a donation, Disney will match dollar for dollar when you donate. For more information about them, check out the uh, merchandise locations throughout the park or just head to their website, DisneyConservationSlug.com. Also, one of the best ways that every single person on this truck can help out is by never purchasing wildlife products. Things with ivory in them, cheetah fur coats, crocodile boots. Please do not buy things like this. Now, friends, if you liked your safari today, my name is Parker. Now, here at Harambe, we do not like to say goodbye. That is far too final and far too sad. So I'm going to leave you with a Swahili phrase, Kwaharini. Now, Kwaharini roughly translates to go well. So, friends, from all of us here at Harambe, go well, go wild, and have a great rest of your day here at Disney's Animal Kingdom or wherever your next adventure might take you. So the safari is one of our favorite things to do here. It is, yes. And one of the things that makes it so great, I think, is the fact that you really never know what you're going to get as far as which animals are going to be out. Yeah. And different times of the day really determine, you know, what you see. Yeah. Um, today, I think in the hundreds of times that I have ridden that ride, I have never had what happened today, I don't think. No. We had a really close-up encounter with a rhino and with a giraffe. You're looking for your family. Sorry, traffic jam. Sorry, I'm about to fall over, just don't mind me. Yes. Um, um, really great, uh, really great footage actually. Yeah.
I think we, we were behind the rhino for probably 10 minutes just following it. weaving though. Yeah. Like you'd think that you had a gap and our driver would try to go and then he would just go back just into stop. the path again. Which Start shout out to Parker, uh, the yeah, cast was... member who was driving the truck today. One did so great. There were a lot of delays on this yeah. and so he kept the information coming. Yep. Also, Parker could have been a uh, Jungle Cruise skipper, just oh, saying. 100%. He was hilarious. So Maybe he is. Maybe he was. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Uh, but he was great. So now that we're coming off of that, before we go into the other areas of the park, I think we're going to hit the Gorilla Falls area. Let's go check it out. Yes. Shout out to our friend Arlene, who would be so thrilled with the bird spotting guide. All right, so if you ever come through the gorilla observation area, That's here's right. all the birds you can expect to see. Hopefully. Hopefully. As something flies very close to my head <laughs> and you didn't see me, but I just jumped. jumped. <laughs> oh been a blooper in the making. Uh, Much like those monkeys that can jump 30 feet. That's about what Molly did with that bird. <laughs> it was awfully close to my it head. It was close to your head. Uh, and I was focused on the bird spotting guide, so. And not the birds. Something that always strikes me whenever we're here is just the sheer amount of information that is available. Oh my God. Um, about each animal, they have like footprints and oh, just all kinds of stuff. Also, uh, you know, over by the Okafi thing, it also talks about why having the observation areas, kind of how to do it in a way to where you don't disturb yeah. the animals. So like, not only is it very informational about the animal itself, but also how to best interact with them and still maintain their environment. Yeah, very cool. It's very cool.
Rafiki's Planet Watch is where Disney's animal science and environment team provides expert animal care and inspires guests to learn more about wildlife and conservation. To access the attraction, you have to board the Eastern Star Railway for a 1.2 mile journey behind the park. In doing so, guests are essentially moved from the more fictional stories in the park to a place that showcases the very real stories about animal conservation, research, and care that take place in Disney's Animal Kingdom and around the world. It is home to both the conservation station and the affection section, a petting zoo portion of the park. There's also currently an animation station within conservation station where you can learn to draw your favorite Disney characters. Anandapur is the mythical town that makes up the Asian portion of the park. An unnamed country located in the floodplains and lower foothills in the Himalayas, it has more of an intermingling between natural spaces and built environments. The area is home to the show Feathered Friends in Flight, the Maharaja Jungle Trek, Kali River Rapids, and of course the thrilling Expedition Everest. One of the jamming flotillas coming up here. That's right. An opening day area, Dinoland USA is a bit of an eclectic uh, choice of areas focused on dinosaurs. You have the academic, you have the amateur, and you have the corporate. We're going to go into a lot more detail in this area later because we're going to do an entire video on Dinoland USA before, you know, it's no longer here. Uh, but of course, the main draw of this area is the Dino Institute big attraction used to be called Countdown to Extinction and very quickly changed its name to Dinosaur to match up with the film that was releasing at that time. Fun fact, here at the entrance there's a replica of Sue, which is the most complete Tyrannosaur skeleton ever found. If I'm correct, I think it's up in Chicago, the actual one. Yeah, I think so. And she is 90% complete. So as much as I love this ride, this area is in dire need of uh, some help. Yeah, I think stylistically, it's, it's never really worked. Um, well, and this is the, the part of the show where we, you know, we're not going to super go into it, but there were some cost cutting measures uh, because yes. Animal Kingdom was a very expensive part and they were trying to save some stuff somewhere. This is how you get like the Chester and Hester dino, whatever that is. So yes. the, the fair attractions, basically. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously there's going to be some changes coming. Which we're go actually heading to go talk about right now. Yeah. So. Stay tuned. <laughs> Of course, Animal Kingdom has continued to grow and change. The rest of Asia debuted in March of 1999 with the Jungle Trek and Kali River Rapids. Expedition Everest would eventually join Asia in 2006 to great success. While other smaller changes have taken place through the years, the biggest change was the closing of Camp Mini Mickey in 2014, which paved the way for Pandora and the world of Avatar. Construction began for the park that year and was planned with the help of James Cameron and his team. The area debuted on May 27, 2017 to great success. We'll definitely focus more on this land in the future. And of course, based on Destination D23 this year, more changes are coming. Dino Land will potentially be making way for an area for Indiana Jones and Encanto. And it's tough to be a bug, we'll be making way for a Zootopia-based show. Well, we hope you guys have enjoyed this in-depth look at Animal Kingdom. Don't worry, we're gonna be back here a lot in the future and going through each individual land in detail. But in the meantime, let us know, comment, uh, what is your favorite part of Animal Kingdom? Be sure to like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed the video. It really helps us out. We have videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday. But until next time, keep, keep savoring, savoring the, the magic. magic.